So this is Math 466, Advanced Applied Analysis, Lecture 31, give or take. And what we're going to do for the end of the semester is fun applications of Fourier analysis. And so I strongly encourage you to do a little Google search to see if you can find it. I am going to present a more modern proof of the existence of a continuous but nowhere differentiable function. You can see how bad was the original proof, how much of an improvement was this. The proof I'm going to give only works if the parameter a is between 1 half and 1. It's been improved, so you can get it all the way down to 1 half. I really don't see the need in doing something a little bit more technical just for the sake of getting the less than or equal to versus the less than. The goal here is to actually show that there exists a function that is continuous but nowhere differentiable. When you think of a continuous function, you, know, you think, well, some kind of curve like this, it should be differentiable somewhere. Or maybe it has you know, a couple of spiky points that you have to stay away from, but as long as you stay away from those, it will be differentiable. It turns out almost every continuous function is differentiable nowhere. So this gets into something called be a category theorem. This gets into functional analysis. Almost every continuous function is differentiable nowhere. So the way of looking at this is that the space of continuous functions that you know and love is really tiny <laughs> relative to all the continuous functions. What does this remind you of? How I feel in the world. But the Yankees, you know, we just talked about how the Yankees are the international symbol for choking. You should still feel happy for that. Sure. And that has now been preserved for posterity. Think of the rationals. Almost every number is irrational. Almost every number, in fact, is transcendental. It is not the root of a polynomial of finite degree. So you actually have a lot of experience where essentially what you know is insignificant. Now, the good news is we can approximate rational, I'm sorry, we can approximate irrationals by rationals. And you're given any irrational, we can find a rational arbitrarily close. If we use continued fractions, we can do a very very good convergence with very small denominators. So even though almost every continuous function is nowhere differentiable, it turns out that we can find differentiable functions that are very close to our continuous function. And so the idea is to look at a Fourier series and choose everything carefully. So we're going to let f of x be the sum, and I'll do it this way, OK n goes from 0 to infinity of a to the n cosine 2 to the n 2 pi x. And we'll have 1 half is strictly less than a is strictly less than 1. OK? So if you look at this, the first question is, does this function converge? Does this series converge at each point x? Well, cosine is always between minus 1 and 1. I have a geometric series here, so it converges at every point. So it converges and is continuous. All right, so I'll leave it as an exercise to show that it's continuous. If it's differentiable, how would you calculate the derivative? So assume it's differentiable. Yo. Don't worry about whether or not you're allowed to. How would you calculate the derivative? How would you want to calculate the derivative? Term by term. Right? Pass the derivative through the sum. Ah, when we take the derivative, we're going to get you know, the cosine becomes a negative sign. Then we'll have a 2n, 2, 2 to the n, times 2 pi coming down. Since a is greater than a half, when the 2 to the n comes down, we're going to lose all the geometric decay. And now we'll basically have sums of. <coughs> You know, infinitely many sums of sines and cosines. I'm sorry, infinitely many sums of sines. It turns out the derivative, the pointwise differentiation, is not going to exist. That sum will not converge. That's not a proof that this function isn't differentiable. Otherwise, the lecture would be a lot shorter. It just means that if it is differentiable, we cannot take the derivative by going term by term. So here is a nice fact. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to assume we have a very interesting function where most of the Fourier coefficients are 0. And then only every now and then do you get a non-zero coefficient. So let's assume, uh, say we have some function, you know, g of x is the sum of, um, I just want to try to use the same notation. All right, we'll use am 
and we're going to do it now. E m of x. Say we have something like this. Now here, because we're getting cosines, we have a function that's even. So the odd and even ones are going to be reinforcing. I'm sorry, the, the positive and the negatives are going to be reinforcing. So here's the lemma. Uh, if the Fourier coefficients g hat of m satisfy the following, let them be 0 if m is not of the form 2 to the n, and then a n if m equals plus or minus 2 to the n. And then I'll allow myself a little sign over here. Uh, so we have to be, I can either be the positive one or the negative one. If g is differentiable, then we have that these coefficients have to be less than or equal to some constant c times n times 2 to the minus n. Then, so there exists a c such that. So what we're saying is, imagine we have some Fourier series. Imagine that most of the coefficients are 0, and the only ones that aren't are 0 are when m happens to be a power of 2, or the negative of a power of 2, because we can go in both directions. Then those coefficients have to have a certain decay rate. And you might say, well, you know, what value of c do I take? The, val the value of c doesn't really matter. What really matters is the n dependence, that they have to be smaller than n over 2 to the n. Okay. So imagine we can prove this lemma. Well, if you look at this, this is a even function. Cosine is even. There's no sine terms. So this is basically saying the m and the negative m term have the same coefficient, so the sine part cancels, the imaginary part cancels. And now we're saying our a is between 1 half and 1. So our a is greater than 2 to the negative n by a significant amount. Maybe it's you know, 3 fourths, or maybe it's 1.5 over 2. Our a's here are too large relative to this. You know, this is telling you, essentially, you have to be smaller than 1 half to the n. You, you can have a small multiplicative constant that doesn't matter. You can have a small n dependence. But if we had anything here, because it's greater than 1 half, you're going to have a higher power that will, you'll have an exponential thing, and the polynomial n is not going to be enough to do it. So if you want, think of it as, you know, if a equals 1.5 over 2 to the n, then this is your 1.5 to the n, 2 to the negative n. There's the 2 to the negative n, but 1.5 to the n is growing much faster than any constant times n. And in fact, it doesn't have to be 1.5. Even 1 plus epsilon would suffice. So if this lemma is true, then this function can't be differentiable. And again, this is a very special function we're looking at. This is, if you want, very similar to showing that the number pi or the number e is transcendental. This is very different than showing almost all numbers are transcendental. This is very different than showing almost all continuous functions are differentiable nowhere. This is finding one example. And so the note from my professor you know, says, you know, uh, Weierstrass distressed 18th century mathematicians or 19th century mathematicians when he came up with this example. Because it was thought, well, if you're continuous, you should be different at least somewhere, probably even in most places. So the question is, how will we prove a lemma such as this? So we're going to use Fayer series. And there's a really nice calculation for how this is done. So recall the Fayer kernel. Um, fn of x is something like sine squared n pi x, I think, over n pi x, something like that. The pi's don't really matter. 
The main thing is that the Faye kernel looks like this. It's also the sum uh, k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of 1 minus the absolute value of k over n e to the kx. So it's a weighted Fourier series. When k is small, the coefficient is essentially 1. But as k gets very, very close to n, then the weight becomes almost 0. In fact, I could have had the sum go all the way up to n, but there's really no point, because if I go up to n, I've now got 1 minus 1, which is 0. So the nice way of doing the algebra is to note the following. So let's say we are looking at one of our coefficients. So you know, from something like this, the only coefficients that are going to survive are the coefficients when m equals 2 to the n or m equals negative 2 to the n. So for f, only need coefficient at plus or minus 2 to the n. And the same would be the case for g, because all those other coefficients are just 0. How do we calculate a Fourier coefficient? Well, a standard way would be integrate from, say, minus a half to a half g of x e to the negative 2 pi i mx dx. And we'll take m to be 2 to the n. And that's the standard way to calculate the coefficient. If this is what I write, this is going to be a little bit of a hard integral to do. I'm trying to get a nice identity involving the coefficients. And so the clever observation, I just want to write it in the correct way, is to look at this is, you can view it as the dot product of g with the function e to n. This is the same as the dot product of g e to n times f, and I think it's 2n minus 1, 2 to the n minus 1. So let's think about what's going on here. This is the Faya series <coughs> going up to 2 to the n minus 1. So e 2n of x times f 2 to the n minus 1 of x. This is e to the 2 pi i 2 to the n x. And now I have a sum. k goes from 0 to 2 to the n minus 1. I'm just making sure I've got my minus 1s in the correct spot. Yes, minus 1 of 1 minus absolute value of k over 2 to the n minus 1, e to the 2 pi i kx. Well, the easiest term to look at is the term when k equals 0. The k equals 0 term is just going to give us e to the 2 pi i 2 to the n x. This is coming from k equals 0. And then we have all the k not equal to 0 terms. Well, what will be a term when k is not equal to 0? I'll have some value of k, and then I'm adding 2 to the n. So I'll have you know, a sum k goes from 1 to 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1, 1 minus absolute value of k over 2 to the n minus 1. And now I have e to the 2 pi i k plus 2 to the n x. And now all we need to note is that this is not of the form 2 to the n, because k does not get as high, does not get high enough. So now when we take the dot product, the only term that survives is going to be from this. Because we've chosen our function, very, very carefully. Uh, 
Okay. Any questions? So there's one mistake on the board. It's minor, it's easy to fix. So something was defined incorrectly. Good, the phase series is incorrectly defined. And you should have known that it was incorrectly defined. I'm sorry, uh, over, over here? Could be, it, it might be 2n plus 1. Um, that, that, that could be slightly off. There's something wrong with this definition, and you should know that there's something wrong. So whenever you see an equation, you should always be asking if things are reasonable. This equation can't be right as written. Because if it's right, then it's written in a very stupid way. So I have a sum, k goes from 0 to n minus 1, of 1 minus the absolute value of k over n, e k x. Why do you need the absolute value? Right? Can't be right as is, or we wouldn't have the absolute value of k. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was working with some students in small, and we needed an equation. The paper had an integral of a even function against an odd function. And it was a integral that was symmetric about 0. So what should the answer be? Zero. That term shouldn't be there. We thought that they actually dropped a factor and that the odd term actually should have had an extra factor of x and it should have been an even function. And just by looking at this, we were pretty sure that there was a mistake in the paper. So this should really be k goes from negative n minus 1. If you looked at it the way we had it over here, we never had the negative frequencies. So all that changes is now when we come over here, k goes from negative 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1. And so now we just have to change the very last bit over here. I'll just write it as um, plus or minus k over here. And then the exact same argument as before holds, and we will see that all of these terms, when we integrate against our function g, will never have plus or minus k plus 2 to the n be a perfect power of 2, except when k is 0. And thus, this integral is going to give us the correct Fourier coefficient. In general, you can't do this. The only reason we can do this is because the coefficients are supported at powers of 2. Okay? And none of these are high enough to push it to the next value. You know, if k could get as large as 2 to the n, we'd be in trouble. Is it not shown yet that that will have coefficients only at 2 to the n? You're just working with g till now, right? Well, what I'm saying is, imagine you have a function g that only has coefficients at 2 to the n then their coefficients have to have this decay rate. And if that's true, then we get this immediately. You know, we get this instantaneously because our a is too large. So we've reduced the problem to showing that if I have a, a function whose Fourier coefficients only live at powers of 2, then if I want differentiability, the, the coefficients can't be too large. And our coefficients here are too large. So what we've done over here is we've now found a nice way to calculate the coefficients of g. Instead of just doing the standard integral, we can do this integral. Why is this integral better? Well, we have this nice phase series. And so we have some information about this function f2n, and it's going to help us. Now, if you look at this, of course, we have this x down below, which is blowing up as x goes to 0. But we're assuming our function is differentiable. Without loss of generality, what do you want to assume about g of 0? That 
Yeah, we should probably assume g of 0 is 0. All that does is it just translates the function. If I add you know, 5 or 6 or 7, it's not going to change any of the other Fourier coefficients. So we might as well assume here that g of 0 is 0. Okay. If our function wasn't even, we could even play games and make it even. But So our function is 0 at 0. So if you look at the Fayer kernel, um, we get to divide by x down below. But since our function g of 0 is 0, dividing by x is not that dangerous. Right? That quotient will be bounded. And oh, wait. actually, is it pi x squared down below? Um, just, it's not squared, it's just pi x? Okay. Okay, yeah, it's just pi x. Okay, good. So dividing by x is not going to be bad <coughs> because we're assuming the function is differentiable. g of x over x will have a limit as x goes to 0. And we've talked before about how differentiability is actually a stronger concept than you need. You could do hold it. I'm not going to really worry about that. The point of this is we want to somehow exploit the fact that we're assuming a function is differentiable. If I just do this integral directly, it's hard to exploit the differentiability of g. What do I like about this? Well, I'm dividing by n. Dividing by n is great for making things small. And we'll take n to basically be you know, 2 to the n, or 2 to the n minus 1, something like that. And so the point of that is this is going to give us decay down below. Now, we know that the Fayette kernel integrates to 1. So if you think when x is really, really small, sine squared n pi x is like n pi x squared. I'm, I'm sorry, it's like, n, it's like n pi x for sine, so since we're screwing, it's like n squared pi squared x squared. So we'll have like an n squared over n that's going to be good for us. OK? So what we want to do now is actually evaluate the integral. Are you sure this is not pi x squared? I'm pretty sure it's pi x squared. I added that it's n sine squared of pi x. For the Fayette kernel? Oh, okay, oh, okay, oh, yeah, 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 that's right. So you have it as n sine of pi x squared, like this? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. What I had written initially had to be wrong. Why did it have to be wrong? I'm sorry? Not quite. If I have sine squared n pi x just over x, or even over sine of x, the numerator is even, the denominator is odd. This is a function that will take on negative values. The Fayette kernel is non-negative. This is how I know I had to have dropped a square. So the whole point of this is the following. When x is really, really small, what does sine pi x look like? It looks like pi x. And so what you can do is you can show that the sine of pi x is less than or equal to uh, c1x, and it's greater than or equal to c2 of x. And we can assume 0 is less than c2 is less than c1. So this is an exercise to show that this is true. If you think about the Taylor series expansion for sine, it's you know the sine of u is u minus u cubed over 3, plus u to the fifth over 5. 
So we're taking x between minus a half and a half. And well, unfortunately, pi halves is greater than 1, so you've got to be a little careful, but you've got exponential convergence. So if there was a homework assignment, this would be a really good homework problem. What this is saying is that sine of pi x, it's on the order of x. And then on the other side, you know, well, if x is small, x cubed is smaller than x. And so we should be able to get a lower bound as well. So it's a nice exercise. Make this explicit. Find constant c1 and c2 so that this is true. All right, so now we want to do the integration. So we have our function g of x. So what should be true about g of x over x? And then we, if you want, you can take the limit as x goes to 0. Does it exist? It exists. You know, our function g is differentiable. This is the derivative. So in particular, this implies that if we don't take the limit, this is bounded. This is a continuous function. So this must be less than or equal to some number m. And I'll try to use the same letter they use in the book. I think they use m naught. Okay, they use m naught here. Okay. When we look at something like this, if I want to approximate the size of this, really the denominator is some constant times x squared. Because I've got this free constant over here. I don't really, I'm not trying to show it's less than 3 or 1 fifth or something like that. I just want to show it's less than some constant. I want to sniff out the constant dependence. So I just want to get a sense of how does this grow? How does this change with x? And the real important thing is it's approximately, it's bounded by something linear. If I choose the slope sufficiently high. All right. So we said that our coefficient g hat of 2n is the dot product of f with e 2n and then the Feyer series. Um, I think we did 2n minus 1. I'm just making sure. I think they take n to be 2 to the n minus 1. Yes. So this is going to be the integral from minus a half to a half of, oops, of g of x e to the negative 2 pi i 2 to the n x. And then the Feyer series is the sine squared of 2 to the n minus 1 pi x divided by 2 to the n minus 1 sine squared pi x dx. We can take absolute values. So I'll have a 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. I'll have an integral from minus a half to a half. I'll have g of x over x. I'll have x over sine pi x. And then I'll have sine squared 2 to the n minus 1 pi x over sine pi x dx. And this is where we're using the fact that we have a very special function where the only Fourier coefficients that survive are the ones at powers of 2. It allows us to say that it's just this dot product. And now we're using the formula for the Feyer. Now, if you look at this, this is bounded. This is bounded. When we look at this over here, <coughs> We can replace the sine pi x with, you know, 1 over sine pi x will be less than or equal to 1 over c2x. So this will be less than or equal to some new constant over 2 to the n minus 1. 
I can well, we're taking absolute values. So what's the absolute value of the exponential? It's one, right? It's e to the you know, negative two pi i two n x. So it's cosine plus i sine. So this has absolute value one. So what I can do is I'll break the integral up. Um, x goes from say one um, minus one over n to one over n of sine squared two to the n minus one pi x over sine pi x plus the integral x greater than 1 over n in absolute value sine squared 2 to the n minus 1 pi x over sine pi x, all with absolute values. All right, well, when x is greater than or equal to 1 over n, I can replace the sine here with 1. Sine pi x, that looks like 1 over x. So I'm integrating 1 over x from 1 over n to a half, basically. So this is where a little bit more space would be nice. So I'll come over here because I, I want to keep that stated. So we have two integrals to do. So one of the integrals is we're going, you know, x gra greater than or equal to 1 over n of sine squared n, I'm sorry, 2 to the n minus 1 pi x over sine pi x. This would be less than or equal to twice the integral from 1 over n to n, I'm sorry, to, to 1 half. Sine squared is at most 1. And then 1 over sine pi x is going to be less than or equal to 1 over c2x. And that's just from approximating sine. Well, what's the integral of 1 over x dx? Natural log of x. So I have the natural log of x at 1 half minus the natural log of x at 1 over n. Well, negative natural log of 1 over n is the same as the natural log of n. So this would equal you know, 2 over c2 natural log of n um, plus 2 over c2, the natural log of 1 half. But the natural log of 1 half is negative. So this will be less than or equal to 2 over c2. Oh, and here, and sorry, is 2 to the n minus 1. Uh, log of 2 to the n minus 1. And this is basically, you know, less than or equal to, you know, 2 over c2 times n. You know, I make it a little bit large if I call this 2 to the n rather than 2 to the n minus 1. And so what we're seeing is that this second integral over here is basically just of size little n some constant times little n. So this piece here is you know, basically 2 over c2 times little n. So the idea is the integral of 1 over sine is approximately the integral of 1 over x. And we can approximate this here very well. All right, well what about this part over here? Sine squared 2n minus 1 pi x over sine pi x. How would we approximate that integral? So do you think this integral could be large? Right. So you can write sine squared 2n minus 1 pi x is 
to the n minus 1 pi x squared. But you've got to be careful, because remember, n equals 2 to the n minus 1. So when x gets as large as that, now you have something of the size, you know, sine of pi x. So it's beginning to get large. We need to use you know, a little bit of the decay here. When x is very close to 0, uh, if it's extremely close to 0, this is very small, and it's blowing up. But it's blowing up over a very small region. So the question is, how large could this expression be? If I'm in a very small region, I, I'm, I'm a little bit worried because the denominator is blowing up very fast. But I'm integrating over a very short window. This looks a lot like the Fayer kernel. Right? But the difference is we, we, we only have one sign down here. We don't have two. So the question is, how do we handle the contribution in this one part over here? Well, we can go back to uh, so I'll, I'll do this quickly, and then we'll have to call it a day. So we've got sine squared 2 to the n minus 1 pi x over pi x in absolute value. All we need to do is show that this integral isn't that bad when we only go up to 1 over n. Well, we know sine is basically sandwiched between c2x and c1x. So this would be less than equal to c2x down below and c1x upstairs. So we would have you know, c1 squared 2 to the n minus 1 squared pi squared x squared. And then we integrate that from 0 to 1 over 2 to the n minus 1, and then we double. And now if you look at it, we also have a, um, we had our C2, and we had a 2 to the n minus 1. And we put all the pieces in. Well, let's think about what's going on now. We have a 2 to the n minus 1 squared. We have a 2 to the n minus 1 over here. That's problematic. We still have a 2 to the n minus 1 surviving. But we have x squared over x. So that's an x. When we integrate that, we get x squared. And then when we evaluate it, 1 over 2 to the n minus 1, we get a 1 over 2 n minus 1 squared. That cancels this out. And it leaves us with a 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. So at the end of the day, this would be less than equal to some new constant, c double tilde, over uh, 2 to the n minus 1. Or if you want, over 2 to the n. And that's enough to finish the proof. That that gives us that both of these terms are small. This piece over here is basically now of size at most 1, and we divide by 2 to the n minus 1. So I was actually putting in the extra 2 to the n minus 1 here. I probably shouldn't have done that. But this piece over here, when you include the 2 to the n minus 1, is going to be small. So to just briefly you know, recap as to where we are, we have a function. We're assuming it's differentiable. We then showed that if the function has only Fourier coefficients of powers of 2, we could express their Fourier coefficients by just doing this dot product. And the idea is we want to use the fact that this Fayer series, this uh, Fayer um, kernel, is nice. And we have this nice representation of it as you know, sine squared you know, n pi x over pi x squared. And so because of that, we then break the integral up into two parts, the part near 0 and the part away from 0. The part away from 0, we then just bound and say, well, look, we could just approximate the denominator. It's at most like 1 over x with some constants. The sine squared is going to be of size 1. It's not going to really matter. What about the other part when we're near 0? When we're near 0, we have to be a little bit more careful. And this is where we overestimate. You know, the numerator is at most c1x in terms of approximating for sine. The denominator is at least 1 over c2. And so we now get a nice bound 
because we know we can sandwich sign between two linear functions in absolute value. And now we get an x squared over x. We get x when we integrate, we get an x squared. Because we integrate over such a small region, that's enough to cancel with that. Yes? I thought you were saying you showed that if it was a continuous function, there is a function that's No, I'm claiming that. We don't have time to do that. This just shows that there is a continuous function which is nowhere differentiable. The next thing is to then show that given a continuous function, you can always find a differentiable function arbitrarily close to it. And you need some notion of what it means to be close. So we don't, we don't have that. What we have here is just that um, we can find a continuous function that's differentiable nowhere. And so as long as we choose A to be sufficiently large, we're fine. But we assume that G is differentiable. We assumed G was differentiable and we got a contradiction. Okay. So we assumed if G was of this form, then their coefficients had to have this decay. And we then showed that they don't actually have that decay. And since they don't have that decay, then we're done. Okay. So I'm going to stop here.